Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Jessica Transick. Thanks for coming to this presentation. Hopefully, we've built up, you know, suspense rather than lost your attention with this delay. But I'm going to be talking about the research and, um, you know, the research insights and sort of the methodology that I've developed really over the last two decades for understanding how to accelerate the development of beneficial technology. Um, I've focused on the application of climate change um, in most of my work, but the theories and the insights I've developed can also apply to other technologies as well. So the problem of climate change, um, you know, it's, it's a big one, and I'm just showing an image here where we see smog that's related to wildfires that has tangible, you know, if you're exercising in a smoggy environment that has tangible impacts on health and so forth. But as you all know, the impacts of climate change extend well beyond um, the impact shown here, the impact shown here. And for example, for some small island nations, they are really threatened with um, complete removal. And so it's, it's a real pressing problem. You know, they, they are, it's, it's not something that money can fix um, to address these impacts. And um, this is a very urgent problem, I think many people would say. Um, and as a result of, you know, the science that's been going on for really more than 100 years on understanding this problem, there's been a growing um, effort internationally, uh, which has ebbed and flowed over time, but to set global climate targets. So we just concluded an international climate meeting um, in Glasgow recently, some of you may know, and um, back in, when the last, um, well, some years ago when the climate meeting was held in Paris, for the first time after you know, many of these international climate meetings, world leaders came together and agreed upon a uh, target for, b above which uh, the intention was to, um, or the intention, a temperature target to limit global temperature rise to below two degrees Celsius. Now, two degrees Celsius um, is estimated, staying within that target is estimated to address and mitigate and prevent some of the most severe impacts of climate change, but you know, it, it's, it's not good enough for, for many people, including a number of the small island states that I mentioned uh, before that are really threatened with um, complete sort of removal of their land masses above, uh, you know, sort of, and, and sea level rise that, that would cause complete displacement. And so as a result of that, uh, global leaders uh, also in the Paris Agreement, they also put in a more aggressive target, which is a 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius temperature target and with an intention to stay uh, within that target. So the official target ag agreed upon in Paris was, was two degrees, but with an intention to stay below 1.5 degrees global temperature rise. Now, what do you see when you look at these trends? What does this look like? It's um, a very precipitous drop. If we go forward in time to 2021, you can see that you know, the drop in emissions is very steep. If you go to this target and we look at 2021 on this plot here, the drop in emissions is extremely steep. So is this at all practically feasible? Um, well, uh, one way to reduce emissions um, at these fast rates, which are rates that are faster than the increase in emissions that we've seen since the onset of industrialization in the late 1800s, one way to achieve these rapid reductions would be to have a central planner at the global level. You know, governments come together, they set a target, and you know, policies are put in place, technologies are deployed, and emissions are rapidly reduced. That's not how the world works. Uh, we do not have such a target. There is no such central planner. So instead, the effort must come from a number of different individuals, policymakers that are setting climate policies, which have, at least up to this point, been at best piecemeal. Um, but you know, they're strengthening 
in their uh, ambition and in you know, the momentum behind those policies. But there's also a role for private industry to play, for researchers working at places like MIT. There's a role for people working on manufacturing floors. There's a role for lots of people to play. So really, to address uh, this challenge, what we need is a lot of efforts, essentially from the bottom up, a few from sort of a, the national level policy, but then a lot of efforts from industry and um, researchers and people across the economy to try to bring about this change. Now, the change has to come from a technological transition as well as possibly, you know, demand response and behavioral changes. Ideally, this transition would come with other benefits, other improvements to the quality of life, and, and it must support as well the growing um, economic growth trends that many countries aspire to that are still developing their economies. So where are we in bringing about this transition? We essentially have a couple of decades to bring about a technological transition. What I see happening in industry is that there's a real recognition, and many of you may or may not agree with this, we can have discussion about it, that uh, there's enough of a, uh, even though climate policy is a bit uncertain, there's enough of a risk to, uh, to not acting and not being part of this transition. So there's this climate policy risk. Um, the policy landscape is a bit uncertain. There are policies. I think a number of companies that I talk to are seeing that, okay, to, to you know, we have to, we're used to dealing with uncertainty and risk and to keep ahead of this, we're gonna actually act, we're gonna set our own targets, and we're gonna push forward on uh, meeting these emissions reduction targets. So that's one trend that I see happening. But overall, what my research has been focusing on for the last two decades is to understand how we can be more intentional about developing technology to meet, meet big societal challenges. There are some examples where we've been quite successful at that. So we recently had an example with the development of COVID vaccines. And in general, in healthcare, I would say that you know, the models, the epidemiological models, the public health models are really far advanced in terms of understanding you know, in advance what impact a technology could have and using that to inform efforts. In other areas of technology, including energy, we haven't been you know, historically so good at that but I think we're developing new insights to be able to be a bit more intentional about the technologies we're developing. Uh, for example, um, you know, by setting quantitative targets for individual devices that we may have agency over that could bring about a larger system-wide change. So that's really what my research focuses on. And the research field that I've been developing over the last couple of decades, and this has been growing, uh, the momentum behind this has been growing. So the presentation you know, that we just heard from, from Tony Bonasisi, it's great to see some of the work that he's now doing in this area. Um, and so the research objective that I have is to understand and shape technological innovation, especially in clean energy systems, to accelerate equitable climate solutions. Um, this is a schematic of what I'm trying to indicate here with this feedback loop in the middle. And, um, and also the example of solar and wind energy. So what we've seen in the example of solar and wind energy and also recently in lithium ion batteries is that there's been this positive feedback loop that has formed between government policies, you know, as sort of piecemeal as they've been, they've generated momentum in the private sector. There's been a lot of also public sector research, but a lot of private sector activity that's led to a precipitous cost decline in re renewable energy, and then that feeds back into enabling stronger commitments to reducing emissions. So we can look at a picture like this and understand it qualitatively. And my research is about trying to understand, you know, sort of quantitatively, where does this come from? Also qualitatively, developing more theory and understanding how we can intervene in, you know, this system, whether we're in industry, whether we're, you know, doing research, um, we're making investments in technologies, wherever we are, to sort of be part of this positive feedback loop. And there's also an economic benefit and a competitiveness advantage from that. Um, so the methodology that I've developed is to 
essentially um, develop these data informed models that are sometimes mechanistic, sometimes data based, to measure technological innovation, understand the drivers, and quantify performance targets. And I'll give you a couple of concrete examples in a second. But this um, methodology can be applied across scale. So when I say technology, I take a very broad definition of that term to include not just individual devices, but entire infrastructures. Technology includes not just hardware, but also software and even business models and institutional knowledge. So the question is, how can we you know, and, and my role as a researcher is, you know, to try to understand how technologies improve, why, and for specific technologies, how we might intervene to accelerate that process and where we're going for. Can we quantify targets that we're trying to reach? Um, the results are in two primary areas, that the results coming out of my research. One is in new fundamental knowledge of the drivers of technology innovation. So many of you may know that technology is one of the less understood big problems in economics. And part of the challenge is that we've you know, focused in, in economics research on technology in such a way that it's treated as a little bit of a black box. In engineering, the focus has been more on specific devices. But there's this space in between, which is a theory of technology and understanding why technologies improve this understanding ends up having very practical uh, impact for people developing specific technologies. So I'll talk about some insights uh, from that work. And then this idea of targets, can we quantify targets? You know, if, if you say, I'm gonna develop a better battery, on, along what dimensions should we define better given the system-wide change that, that we'd like to see? Um, looking at what are those quantitative targets? Okay, so let me give you some examples of, um, from this area first here. Uh, so we've seen a major cost improvement in these three technologies, solar energy, wind energy, and lithium ion batteries. And because of these three technologies, essentially we're in a very different place. I say we, sort of society as a whole, in terms of addressing climate change um, because of the 99% cost decline in solar energy and that we've documented recently the 97% cost decline in lithium ion batteries and the cost of wind energy has also come down dramatically. So it's only three technologies, but these are three, we could call them success stories, um, but to really address climate change and meet those targets that we mentioned before, the process, the transition needs to include and draw on other technologies and the process has to go faster. So part of my work has been to try to understand, and I'll show you the example of solar energy, but to try to understand why have these costs fallen. So solar is often held up as a success story in terms of clean energy innovation, but quantitatively, what caused this cost decline? Where did this success come from? And so I'll show you some, some results on that uh, in a second. And just to say that on Monday, we'll be publishing a similar analysis on lithium ion battery technologies and the reason for lithium ion battery technologies, rapid cost decline, and what we can learn for the future development of energy storage that's coming out on mo this Monday. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of skip over this, but the idea here with this research is to understand, you know, at the level, actually let me go back to here, at the level of the device and the manufacturing process, the level of engineering, what drove the cost decline, and then at a higher level in terms of research and development activity, economies of scale, learning by doing, how much did those mechanisms contribute, and then policies, what role did government policy play? And this is looking backward in time, but then when we develop these models and they're quantitative, then we can also look forward in time. So let me just, so, so what we found for solar energy is that the cost decline came from a number of different low-level mechanisms. I'm not showing those there, but one of the reasons for this technology is rapid and sustained cost decline is that there were greater than five low-level mechanisms that each contributed more than 10% to that cost decline that I showed in a minute, which is really a, 
a very rapid cost decline among energy technologies. At the high level, research and development, a good portion of it happening in the private sector, was the single largest contributor. And at the level of policy, if we just look at the right plot, um, there, what we estimate is that about 60% of the cost decline came from policies that stimulated markets. Why did these policies work? Well, what they did was that they jump-started a lot of innovative activity in the private sector, competition among firms that led to the cost decline. Public funding, government funding for research and development was also important. We estimate about 30% of the cost decline came from government funding for research and development. So now we have some insight about you know, what caused this success story in the past and from there, we can, and you know, the idea is that we can hopefully inform our efforts for the future. So these models can be used also prospectively to understand where are the levers for cost reduction going forward in other critical energy technologies. Uh, we also look at some cases where costs have risen. So new, US nuclear plants, the trend in costs there has been going in the opposite direction. It wasn't just slower than solar energy's cost decline, it actually costs rose over time. So we've done an extensive analysis of why that is and that insights can be applied to the development of other, um, you know, other approaches that are coming out now for, for potential, you know, hopefully less um, costly nuclear plants and a cost trend in the other direction. Uh, okay, so let me just say a couple things now, very briefly, about uh, this second area of research results, which is more about, not less about understanding the process of technology innovation and the drivers that we can use to accelerate the process going forward, but more, what is the, what is the end point? Uh, what, for a given technology, what are we aiming for in terms of cost targets? So, or performance targets. So for batteries, for electric vehicles, if you want to replace uh, light duty vehicles with electric vehicles, given how people behave and how they drive in their cars and given a certain charging infrastructure design, how energy dense does that battery need to be? What is the cost point that would allow it to be competitive? If we're talking about a, an electric power system that relies largely on solar and wind energy, how inexpensive would your stationary storage technologies have to be in order to allow for cost competitive or you know, electricity supplied at costs that are the same as the cost today? So again, I'll show you a couple of examples. And um, these are focused primarily on, you know, I work on all energy services and essentially all energy technologies, but these examples are focused on the currently more difficult to decarbonize energy services. Uh, that is load following electricity, long haul um, transportation. And I'll also give an example of some upcoming research on um, hydrogen fuel, which could be used potentially for a number of these difficult to decarbonize energy services. So the basic idea is that for each one of these individual devices, the target is gonna be driven by something else. And what we see is that the targets are often driven by the behavior of the system, either on the supply side or on the demand side. So if we look at reaching deep decarbonization targets with solar and wind energy, really the driver of, you know, at that level of, uh, renewables adoption, the driver for cost targets for energy storage are not gonna be the daily, the hourly, or even the seasonal fluctuations in the wind and solar energy resource. It's actually these rare but extreme shortage events in solar energy that happen only a handful of times over 20 years. So we looked at this problem and sort of starting from actually the you know, data on solar and wind energy resources and then understanding how a storage system would cycle and cost optimizing the whole system, we're able to identify um, cost targets for stationary storage. And I can go a little bit into what those cost targets are, but essentially you really need to drive down the cost of energy capacity, probably an additional 80 to 90% cost reduction in the 
energy capacity costs of lithium ion batteries today. So I just mentioned that costs have fallen. In order to rely on this system, you need further cost declines. You can also do this with a combination of transmission infrastructure expansion, demand management, potentially hydrogen fuel. Um, okay, so that is one example. We're also doing a similar thing with uh, an analysis that's not yet published on green hydrogen, where here we're actually looking not at the shortages in renewable energy, but the excesses. So in, if you cost optimize a renewable energy system, what you see is in that those cost is that in those cost optimal systems, you're always going to oversize your wind and solar capacity relative to the output power. That's, that's the cost optimal solution. It has to do with the fact that solar and wind energy costs are quite low presently and storage costs are a bit higher. So as a result of this, you have, and many of you may know, you're gonna have a lot of excess renewable energy. Now this excess renewable energy is not always available. So anything that fluctuates, as many of you probably know, can be a little bit more challenging to deal with, but if we're able to understand those fluctuations, we could potentially build a system, and in this case, you know, really the argument for hydrogen and the way hydrogen can really take off is if we have a more integrated energy system, where the demand for hydrogen is met, you know, by green hydrogen, it could be some of it coming from blue hydrogen, um, you know, where there's CCS installed, and that hydrogen is used for electricity, but also for other energy services. So that's something that we're working on as well. And just as the final example, and then I'll wrap up here. Um, and yeah, so in the case of long haul transportation, you know, and, and this is the case in this paper, we looked at personal vehicles, but if you're looking at heavy duty transportation, the problem's even harder. But the question uh, is, that we addressed here, is what are the targets for charging infrastructure that can support the convenient and rapid adoption of electric vehicles? Now, if this solution is not convenient, then you know it's not gonna be adopted. So what we wanted to do is sort of get beyond just kind of talking about the priority locations for chargers, but actually quantifying the effects given the behavior of people in their vehicles, given the diversity of behaviors across the population, where people stop for how long. So we looked across the entire US and uh, looked at how people are driving and developed a model to forecast the energy consumption of individual trips and so forth. Anyway, what we ended up with were a handful of priority locations for supporting electric vehicle adoption. And those include residential charging, so charging when people are at home, uh, charging at workplaces, that's good for the power grid, fast charging along highways, so those first two locations, home and work, doesn't have to, those don't have to be fast chargers. They can be a lower power variety, uh, but along highways and long rural roads, you want fast chargers, and also chargers where people stop overnight. And so we're able to quantify the effects of these different infrastructural strategies and you know, understand how far you can get with you know, if you're, if you're in a place where maybe the resources are less, you can't install as many fast chargers, how many more home chargers or work chargers would you want to install there in order to support um, the adoption of electric vehicles by a fraction of the population? Now, there are many other dimensions to consider in terms of, you know, if we're to understand whether people will adopt electric vehicles, you know, there's a lot of personal preferences and, and model, um, you know, the questions about preferences for different vehicle models and so forth to consider. But this is an, a really important uh, part of that decision is, is, you know, to supply convenient charging. Okay, so this work uh, informs a number of different real world decisions, including decisions by engineers, private investors, policymakers, et cetera. I think I'll mostly skip over this, but you know, there are a number of energy storage startups that have used the targets that we've quantified for stationary energy storage. Um, I work regularly with the investment community and sort of, and they're very interested in rates of change and how we can forecast rates of change in different technologies. Um, you know, I work with um, 
policymakers, so this mutually reinforcing cycle of emissions reduction and technology improvement was something that uh, I published a, a report on and shared with the White House ahead of the uh, Paris meeting. Um, you know, informing publics, uh, the public debate and, and consumer decisions in some cases. So we published something called Carbon Counter that allows people to compare the emissions and costs of their vehicles. Uh, so that's, that's basically it. I think I'll just keep this up there and hopefully we still have time for a couple of questions. Um, thank you very much. So yes, question over here. I didn't hear tidal energy mentioned. It's predictable. Tidal. It is across our whole coast. If you go to the Bay of Fundy, the ship will be standing on sand and then a few hours later will sail out. It's that much yeah. uh, difference in tides. Why isn't that used for energy generation? Well, I think, I mean, it is, and there are a number of startups in that space and, and development efforts in that area. So I think it's, it's important, you know, to be looking at a number of different solutions. There's a portfolio problem to solve, of course, where, you know, there's a tension between concentrating your investments in a few very scalable solutions versus diversifying across many, you know, sort of the all of the above strategy. The optimal solution is somewhere in between because you always have limited time and money. So you can't spend, you know, you can't completely diversify, but you also don't want to completely concentrate because of uncertainty about the future. So Tidal is a good, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an option that is being explored. One way to think about the resource is that while there is a lot of coastline, that's sort of a 2D um, picture. Whereas if we're looking at solar or wind, you have, um, or, or rather it's a linear, it's a one dimensional in a sense, we can think of it as a line across the entire coast. So that's quite a lot of coastline. But if you look at entire land masses, there we have a 2D picture um, and potentially 3D if you're accessing winds at higher levels. So, you know, that's one kind of intuitive way to think about the size of these energy resources. But thank you for that question. Uh, Graham Brown from ILP. Uh, it's, I, I like, really like the research you mentioned uh, it presented here because it's very meaningful. All these uh, five or six areas are so meaningful. I think it can be really meaningful to government, to all this, especially institutional investment because they need to look into uh, impact or mission. Uh, beyond the profitability of their targets. And also you mentioned about this uh, optimization of uh, uh, EV charge stations. I know we have some discussions with some IOP member companies. Uh, I wonder if uh, let you choose uh, like uh, the industry partners, including government, what, what kind of uh, targets you would like to, like uh, your ideal part industry partners so I've worked in the past with a wide variety of different industry partners, including technology developers, including infrastructure firms, private investment firms. Um, so it really runs the gamut. And the nature of the projects are different, you know. So if I'm working with someone developing energy storage, that's a certain kind of project. If I'm working with someone that's looking at developing a strategy for investing in clean energy or portfolio that's, you know, more focused on, um, you know, port the port using the portfolio models that, that we've developed and the insights on rates of technological change. But yeah, it's really, I mean, it may seem like a very diverse set, but it's, it's just, that's how I design the research to, you know, really think about the, all of the different levers that we have as a society to advance technology and be more intentional about technology. So there's, there's really something for all of these, you know, different decision makers, something relevant for all of these different decision makers. So thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. 
Other quick question, is your research translatable to other infrastructure challenges such as water management? Yeah, I think so. Um, and the way that I try to kind of have impact in other areas is kind of twofold. One is through the courses that I teach at MIT. So I have students taking classes that are you know, not just interested in climate change, but are interested in being more intentional about technology infrastructure development and innovation, addressing other societal challenges. And then the other way is really um, to focus on um, theory. So whatever I do, it's, you know, if I'm developing insight, I mean, the two really go hand in hand. So if we want to understand what drives technological innovation, we can't just look at the example of one technology. You need to look across technologies. What ends up happening is you get some general insight from that that applies to many different technologies. Um, so that's how we do it. And a lot of people are, if you hear the word theory, would say, oh, you know, this is like, this has very little practical application. But what I find is that often the fundamental insights are the ones that have the most impact in, you know, for firms and other decision makers, practitioners in this space. So, thanks for the question. Okay, and I think we'll leave it there. So give a few minutes to your break. So thank you, Professor Transek. Thanks. Very thought-provoking stuff. <laughs>